Okay, I'm back, picking up where we left off with the argument uh, from your strongest desires as a way of defending psychological egoism. We were talking about the first premise of the argument and some counterexamples to it, some problems with that first premise. And so uh, now we'll shift to the, to, to, to the, to the second premise. Um, so let's come back to the argument, just uh, giving you the context. <clears throat> so again, we have the example of um, going and visiting your aunt uh, out of a sense of duty. And this seems to be uh, uh, something that premise one rules out because premise one suggests that every time you do something, you're motivated by your strongest desire. But when I go to visit my aunt, I'm doing it out of a sense of duty, not because it's what I strongest desire, strong, most strongly desire. And so that's uh, Schaefer Landau's example of conscientious action. Um, premise one seems to rule out the possibility of conscientious action, unless we say that when I go to visit my aunt, my strongest desire is to do my duty. Okay, so there that would support premise one, that even when I go to visit my aunt out of a sense of duty, I'm acting on my strongest desire. That, that, that just happens to be my strongest desire at that moment, to visit my aunt dutifully. <clears throat> um, okay, but that creates a problem for premise two, because premise two says that whenever you are motivated by your strongest desire, you are pursuing your self-interest. But if, I, uh, if my strongest desire is to do my duty and visit my aunt, then I'm not pursuing my self-interest, right? My self-interest would be bound up, presumably, in going and hanging out with my friends and having fun, right? Uh, so if we, if, we, if we allow that sometimes duty is your strongest desire, and that saves premise one, then uh, that, that means that we have to reject premise two, because then we have an example of being motivated by your strongest desire, but not pursuing your self-interest, okay? So either way, it looks like egoists have to, uh, in order to, to, to maintain premise one and premise two, it seems like the egoist has to deny the possibility of conscientious action. Um, it, and, you know, it just seems hard to deny that, right? It seems hard to deny that conscientious action sometimes happens, right? That sometimes we act uh, against our strongest desire, or sometimes our strongest desire is to do something other than pursuing our self-interest. Um, okay. And so the essentially what Schaefer Lando is pointing out that even if we accept premise one that we always act on our strongest desires, right? It doesn't follow from that that our strongest desire is always to pursue our own self-interest. That's what the egoist has to prove. It can't be contained as one of the premises. That's the conclusion that the egoist is trying to draw. But as he says at the top, Schaefer Landau at the top of 99, if we sign on to premise one, then premise two begs the question. It assumes the truth of the conclusion that it's meant to support. It assumes that whenever you're motivated by your strongest desire, you're not doing your duty. You're promoting your self-interest. Um, but that's the assumption that the uh, altruist will reject, and that's the assumption that the egoist is, has to prove. They can't assume it. Right? So right, the argument is preaching to the converted. Right? Premise two is not a neutral thesis. Um, you have to already be an egoist <laughs> to accept premise two. Um, okay, so he goes on to kind of but that's, that's essentially the core of his, of his response to argument one. Uh, let's look at argument two, the argument from expected benefit. And here the idea is that whenever, you, the first premise is that whenever you do something, you, you expect to be better off as a result. And this kind of gets close to sort of Hobbes' view, right? We never do something unless we see some benefit in, a, in it for us, um, right? People always expect their actions to leave them at least a little bit better off um, and so given that that's the case, their constant aim, we're always aimed at gaining from our actions. That's always what's motivating us. So whenever people act, they're trying to get something for themselves, right? That's the prediction that the psychological egoist is making about us based on what he claims to know about our psychology. But the question is whether the, there's an argument to some more support that conclusions. And 
to, su to support that conclusion, right? And so the second premise is uh, that if you expect to be better off as a result of your actions, then you are aiming to promote your self-interest, right? It follows from that. So now again, this is a valid argument. If we accept the first two premises, then the third uh, claim follows, the conclusion follows. But do we have any reason to accept the first two premises? Um, uh, he, he points out that premise one seems to deny the existence of pessimists, right? of people who genuinely don't believe that things are going to be better off for them in the future, no matter what they do. Right? So, so right, the pessimist is someone who does things and you know has reasons to do what he's doing um, and has motives, but he he is not um, he's not optimistic about the future. So whenever he acts, he thinks that things are going to go badly for him, for others, right? But he acts anyway. Uh, that's a potential problem for premise one, because it seems like pessimists really do exist. We're not all optimists. We don't all think that we're we're going to benefit from what we do. Um, okay. Um, or he gives the example of an employee who's late for an important appointment, um, who increases his delay by helping a stranger cross a dangerous street. Right. So let's say um, um, you know you 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 have a, an important meeting to go to. Uh, but as you're racing to get to the meeting, you see someone on the side of the road who needs help. Okay, uh, you stop to help them. Um, you don't expect to be better off as a result of helping that person across the street. If anything, you're putting yourself at risk of being later to the meeting and again, maybe getting fired, right? So there seem to be examples where people do things without expecting to gain from them. Um, um, okay, so again, the egoist might have a way of explaining those examples, like that the person who helps the person across the street might expect some gain in you know, recognition as being a good guy, like he wants other people to think he's a good guy. And so the more he does things like this, he can expect the benefit of, of, of being you know, uh, treated like a good guy by his peers. You know? um, so there might be egoistic reasons for helping the person across the street, even though it also puts him at risk of like being late to his appointment. It might give him something else that he values, right? Okay, but... Um, um, so he leaves uh, premise one alone and looks at the second premise, the one that says that if you expect a benefit, then that is your aim. And again, he thinks that this is a question begging premise. Right? Just because I expect to benefit from something or expect to be better off from doing something, it doesn't follow that that's what's motivating me or that's my primary motive. Um, okay, so he gives the example of someone who, um, who uh, volunteers, like let's say at a soup kitchen. Um, and that person might gain deep satisfaction from the work of helping out others at a soup kitchen. He might get some pleasure from it, and in that sense, gain from it. Right? That the that that's a way of being better off. He gets more pleasure from volunteering at the soup kitchen, doing that work. Um, it satisfies him in some deep way. That may be something that he expects every day. He goes to work at the soup kitchen. He expects to gain some pleasure or to gain some satisfaction in doing good deeds. That may be true of him. That may be true of all volunteers. Um, nevertheless, that doesn't, it doesn't follow that that's what's motivating him to do it. Right? Um, it doesn't show that he is acting self-interestedly just because he gets pleasure from doing it. Right? Um, the pleasure may be incidental. Uh, it may not be the primary motive. Right? So, for example, there may be a given day where he's not feeling very good and he's not getting that satisfaction from the work that he's doing in the soup kitchen, but he does it anyway. And that would show that he's not, that's, uh, while, while, while it may benefit him in some way, that's not what's motivating him to go to the soup kitchen, right? He's motivated by something independent of self-interest. Um, so he considers examples like that to put pressure on premise two. Um, um, and, you know, he goes on and, uh, uh, looks at uh, 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 another statement, um, a principle. Whenever you ex uh, on page one hundred and one, whenever you expect your action to re to result in X, then your aim is to get X. Um, that's a principle um, that just seems uh, uh, false. Right? He thinks the problem with this argument is it's based on that principle G, that whenever you expect your action to result in X, then your aim is to get X. So um, whenever I expect to get money or glory or approval from my actions, then that is my aim, um, right? So, but he thinks this is a false principle. So he gives the example, you know, whenever I lecture to a large audience, right, or whenever I, 
uh, lecture uh, to a small audience on on uh, on um, on uh, uh, virtually, <laughs> I expect some people to fall asleep. I, I don't know, maybe some of you are falling asleep right now. It doesn't follow from that that that's my aim, that that's what's motivating me. I'm not, I'm not motivated by my desire to make you fall asleep, even though I expect that maybe I'm making you fall asleep. Okay, so there's different counterexamples to the principle, right? That's why I'm keeping track of time. But so, right, again, the argument is if we can come up with counterexamples to, to, to G, uh, to, to that principle, then it's then it's a principle that we should not accept. And if that principle is the basis of this argument, right? The, why should we accept premise two because of that principle? Well, if we reject that principle, then we have no reason to accept premise two. And if we have no reason to accept premise two, then even though it's a valid argument, uh, it's not a good argument. The conclusion doesn't follow. Okay, so um, that's why I said these are bad arguments. Um, they're valid, but we don't have any good reason to accept the premises, at least according to Schaefer Landau. Uh, so he considers a couple other strategies, and I'm going to move more quickly here. Uh, one, I've already talked about this, right? The appeal to the guilty conscience. This is not exactly an argument, but it's a way of trying to make egoism plausible as, a, as an explanation for why people do what they do, right? So sometimes people do things that appear to sacrifice their own interests for the sake of justice, let's say, and other higher ideals. They speak in terms of higher ideals. This is what's motivating me. And so they, be, they claim to be acting from, of a, from a moral conscience, right? My conscience is motivating me. Uh, uh, my, my sense of justice is motivating me. Um, and this is a, a, a way of uh, acting from altruism, right? The appearance of altruism, like the desire to benefit others. That's what's moving me. And so you can think of examples where people sort of, you know, explain why they're doing in terms of like higher ideals. Um, but, you know, so the egoist wants to say, look, that's just a way of talking. That's how things appear. But the reality is, that they just don't want to uh, live their lives feeling guilty about themselves, right? So they don't really care about justice for its own sake. They just care about the appearance of fighting for justice because they don't want to uh, uh, feel guilty about themselves, right? Maybe they benefit from the injustice in society. And uh, they, so they want to present themselves as fighting for more justice, but not, again, not because they care about justice for its own sake, but because they're trying to rid themselves of their guilty conscience, and that's a form of egoism, right? Again, the, ar the argument is that, you know, this is not exactly an argument, but the egoist says, like, we can explain every appearance of altruism as, right, an attempt to clear one's guilty conscience, right? And so ultimately what's motivating it is egoism, not altruism, okay? Uh, or we could expand the, the realm of self-interest, right? And we've talked about this in class a little bit, right? The parent and the child, right? It looks like the parent sacrifices her interest for the sake of the child. It looks like an example of altruism. But in reality, that's just the appearance. In reality, the egoist wants to say the parent's interests are bound up in the interest of the child. So in promoting the child's interest, the parent is really promoting her own self-interest. So it's still a disguised form of egoism. And, you know, we can expand it outside the family to like, uh, a, a larger community, right? But anytime someone appears to be sacrificing their interests for the sake of others, right, they're really doing something to promote their own interests because their interests are bound up in the interests of those that they're sacrificing for, okay? Again, that makes egoism seem more plausible, but ultimately uh, Schaefer Landau rejects these strategies as well, and you can think about why. Um, um, I didn't get to, to the egoism, sorry, sorry. So the, he then ends the chapter by thinking about evidence, right? Psychological evidence. Let's let's leave aside the arguments and the strategies that egoists have used to defend themselves, and let's just look at the evidence, right? Um, and so he looks at one particular study by a psychologist named Batson, the empathy altruism hypothesis. And you can think about other studies, maybe that you know from uh, from psychology, but um, uh, right. But this, you know, you can you, you can do your own. Uh, but basically, the idea is that the more someone experiences empathy for a person the more altruistic they become. And so over time, people can evolve to become more empathetic. And we have. And, uh, and the human animal is not the only animal that shows signs of empathy. So there are other animals that are empathetic to each other. And so the idea is that we are not fixed biologically or psychologically to be egoists, right? Uh, we can become more empathetic over time. And, and, and then in that way, altruism can become a motive, right? Uh, it's possible for us to become more altruistic because it's possible for us to become more empathetic to each other. Okay? That's the, so the, the evidence supports that conclusion. Okay. Um, so we're done here. I'm running out of time, but that's my attempt to help you think about the slideshow 
for this week, and I'll see you uh, soon. Okay, that's all. Thanks. Bye. Oh, let me. Here I am. <laughs> okay. Uh, we'll see you next week. Okay. Take care. Bye.